Okay, welcome everybody to our last Great Decisions of 2022. My name is Carrie Whitmore. I'm the Assistant Director here at the Franklin Library. Um, and I'm your introducer to you. And I'll be the one walking around with the microphone later on when we have questions. And I do ask that you wait for me to get to you. Um, the microphone helps obviously amplify your voice so that everyone's able to hear your question, okay? Um, so I would just like to quickly thank our sponsors for this year's Great Decisions. The Franklin Public Library Foundation, the Jerome J. and Dorothy H. Holes Foundation, Carol and Tom Donovan, and uh, in memory of Dora Sargent. When we get to our discussion, please be respectful of all viewpoints. Please stay on topic and try and keep your question and or your response to three minutes, just so that everybody who has a question will be able to ask a question. Um, and then we will end the program at 8 p.m. That was supposed to be at the end, but thank you for coming. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I am going to introduce our speaker for this evening. I know I'm very excited for this topic. Um, I would like to introduce to you Peter Cranstover. He's a retired Foreign Service Officer with USAID, and he spent nearly 30 years in Latin America, Africa, Washington, D.C., and Pakistan, and he's from West Bend, Wisconsin. Yay. Can we get a round of applause for him? Well, it's a pleasure to be here. I have not been to, uh, I'm a little bit embarrassed to say it, frankly, uh, and certainly hadn't seen this lovely library before. It's really, it's really quite impressive. I don't know if some of you have been to our, I live in Cedarburg, my wife and I live in Cedarburg, uh, and is a little bit small, but um, it's uh, got a nice reference area and of course a big public space like this also where we also have these talks and have had with the assistance and coordination of a friend and colleague of mine, John Katzka, who I believe has spoken down here before. <clears throat> when he asked me to help him out, as he usually does in the spring on these great decisions sessions, I said I want to do drug policy in Latin America as opposed to Biden's agenda or industrial policy, I kind of like to talk about things that I've experienced or been involved in here. And uh, so he said, sure, that'd be fine. So I'll give this talk also next week, uh, Thursday actually up in Cedarburg on the 31st, as part of our Great Decisions uh, series up there. So, The social critic and, and curmudgeon H.L. Mencken said when he was talking about, among other things, I know he's not particularly politically correct these days. P.J. O'Rourke, may he rest in peace, was a big fan of his. But he identified an American as the haunting fear that someone, somewhere, may be happy. And so we needed prohibition. <laughs> And the articulation is what this is of our weirdly Puritan need to criminalize people's inclination to adjust to how they feel on occasion. Hence, happy hours, right? Yeah. But with a little bit of apprehension on the part of the United States and some of our allies at the beginning of the 20th century, um, we got together and, and started to negotiate with our, our, some of the bigger players on the international scene and wanted to control the opium trade. And 
Interestingly, the U.S. and China were the two most prohibitionist countries at the time. And they wanted to control the opium trade because the U.S. was aiming to secure not just the prohibition of drugs, but also put a ban on the production and non-medical use of alcohol and attempting to reproduce on an international scale its alcohol prohibition regime, which of course remained in force from 1920 to 19, 1933. So that was negotiated and uh, amended a bit in The Hague then in, in 25 to 28. A lot of talk, a lot of back and forth at that time. No internet, of course. You know. And the ex-colonial powers, if you would, really wanted to control this stuff. So Hoover brings in a guy and puts him in the Treasury Department by the name of Henry Anson. <clears throat> and he makes the use and trade of drugs criminal. But he was only able to really put the arm on people who were involved in trafficking. There wasn't a particularly big interdictive force or law enforcement agency to make him go after people who were smoking marijuana. And indeed, prohibition of alcohol engendered an interesting desire and, and movement towards marijuana use in the states at this time, in the 20s and the 30s. Things continue to be discussed about drugs and the downward spiral of Western civilization. And Lake Success is a little place in Long, Long Island. Powers that be after World War II, and just after the formation of the UN got together and began to talk about some type of enforceable treaties whereby countries would actually go after not only producers but traffickers and users. This is further uh, refined in, in something called the New York Opium Protocol, which limits and regulates the cultivation of the poppy plant. But it really only comes into force in, in 1973, when the Kennedy administration starts to get a little anxiety, you know, anxiety over this. Limited international acceptance on this. As you might imagine, we and the Brits are saying, you know, to everybody else, you really ought to watch your behavior. Oh, and by the way, those things that you've been cultivating for thousands of years, you are doing damage to people. And we don't want you to continue with that. So there wasn't a lot of uh, success with respect to the implementation of these things. <laughs> All of this stuff on yet another track is, comes under the rubric then of something called the Single Convention on Narcotic Drugs in 1961 at the UN. And Among other things, this says to countries that they need to take control of illicit drugs and destroy them. <clears throat> and it preempts all of the other conventions and agreements which have preceded it. Jumping ahead, we survived the 60s, LSD, marijuana, <laughs> the counterculture, and Johnson preoccupied, of course, with the Vietnam War, and just the beginning of inflation, too, right? in 68 and 69. And seeing, of course, some of the ravages on our troops, you know, uh, their use of marijuana and opium while they were in Southeast Asia. Uh, Is unable, is unable to do anything until, uh, and of course, in March of 68, decides that he's not going to run for office. So he's pretty much out of things at that point. And Nixon comes in and immediately declares that he's going to do something about this. And he's able to get something called the Controlled Substances Act 
sorry, about siblings. And, and he's, he's now able to get the Controlled Substances Act signed into law in 1970. And he declares the war on drugs. And says that drug abuse is public enemy number one. And he gets the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Agency, under the Department of Justice to be created in 1973. And he gets about three to four million dollars in that initial budget for it. Reagan, Reagan goes on to follow this policy. And the DEA really in the 70s starts interdiction, they start arrests, they start looking at cocaine trafficking, certainly from where 90, 95% of it has always come from, from Latin America. And uh, passes the Anti-Drug Abuse Act, which establishes mandatory minimum sentences. Mandatory minimum sentences. Perhaps I can use the walk around one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Also. Thank you. a little better. Yes. Okay. So he also, uh, Nixon and Reagan, start to pour a lot of money into Latin America through USAID, through the State Department, in some instances also through a DOD, through the Pentagon, in order to do interdiction. So the whole issue here becomes a policy and a philosophy of policing and punishment and a supply side target on the source of drugs, right? most of which is grown in the Andean region, Colombia, Bolivia, and, and Peru. Reagan goes on to name Mexico a drug negligent nation, something that you can imagine the Mexicans weren't particularly pleased about. Nonetheless, and Nixon and Elvis, you know, at the White House, the famous picture, I'm old enough to remember when this came out in the New York Times, <laughs> brought him in because Elvis had said, as you may recall, some of you may recall, that he didn't, he didn't particularly like the hippies or the anti-war protesters or the Black Panthers or the communists, and, but he did love America. And in what was really a genius political move, Nixon brought him in and made him an honorary DEA agent at the time. <laughs> so ultimately, and I'm just going to focus on this, this particular area, post-World War II, you have a number of different chapters in, in, in this, our fight, the U.S. fight, and U.S. policy regarding Latin America since, since, since the early 40s, uh, late 40s, early 50s. You have prohibition that was reflected in some of those conventions and treaties that I mentioned earlier, so, which went after supply control and interdiction. You've got the Nixon and Reagan years where they really put uh, a large emphasis on, on policing and on punishment. The Colombians, who can be blamed for a lot of this, at least growing it, because they have for thousands of years, initially started the real industrial sort of trafficking of cocaine into the United States and other parts. Only in the past maybe 15 to 20 years have they gotten into Western Europe and Western Africa, actually, also. The Mexicans, after some nasty fights with the Colombians, are basically your wholesalers, right? Your traffickers that move the stuff from Colombia into, uh, goes from Colombia by the Colombians into Mexico and then into the United States. In the 90s, the Colombian cartels, because of a lot of heavy handed uh, and, and aggressive tactics by, by the United States as well as by the Colombians, 
you know, a lot of pressure on a fellow by the name of Cesar Gaviria, who was the Colombian president at the time, managed to break up the cartels that sort of atomized and reformed and continue in one form or another to this day. Because of that, and the chaos that ensued in Colombia, the Colombians came to us in October of 1998 and asked for some assistance in order to push back on this. Colombians have a particularly, or had a particularly toxic sort of mix of factors that of violence and great income disparities and a number of ideologically, um, rather fiercely ideologically leftist insurgent groups, the ELN and the, and, and the FARC, the FARC, and the Colombians at this time in the late 90s were genuinely concerned that the FARC in particular, which had been operating since at least the mid 50s, was going to overthrow the government. That lasted till about 2010, 2011, when the Merida Initiative, named after a city in, in the Yucatan in Mexico, came into play, which is a slightly different focus. And then, what suffuses this whole narrative is the constant debate between demand reduction and public health strategies uh, and, and, uh, and, and supply side stuff, the interdiction stuff. And demand reduction and public health strategies seems to be gaining a little bit of a footing now, a little bit of a purchase with respect to policymakers about how to deal with drugs. We're just, we'll talk about marijuana and cocaine for the most part in the Western Hemisphere. And I'm gonna go back and forth a little bit on these slides, so if you start to get dizzy, or indeed, if you wanna interrupt me, just put your hand up. So, when people talk about Colombia, people who have lived there or worked there are policy makers in that regard. They talk about Colombia being too small, its government being too small for its territory. And what they essentially mean is that they're regulatory, their institutional, their democratic, their governmental reach is just too small or too weak in order to really provide the kind of overall um, services in, from roads to education to everything else. And in 98, President Pastrana, who had recently been elected in August of 98, came up and he went to Bill Clinton in, in October. They met at the White House and he said, look, you know, he said, Bad guys, are, and they were about 40 miles south of Bogota at the time. The FARC uh, would have been getting guns from any number of places over the years. And so over a period of about a year and a half in Washington, various agencies came together and put together a plan that ultimately became known as Plan Colombia, which Clinton signed into law in, in the summer of 2000. And what that did was to, and then, <laughs> That reflected, of course, legislative input, but appropriated money for these kinds of things. Human rights and judicial reform, what we call alternative development, which is a, is a nice title for really economic development, but on a full scale. Police, courts, infrastructure, primary health care, education, and indeed, something to take a look at, uh, or um, something with regard to, at the time in any case, a population of perhaps three million people within Colombia who had been displaced by this constant back and forth between various armed groups, between the FARC and the AUC, which was a right-wing militia organization, and between the ELN and, and the AUC, vying and looking and trying to hold territory, particularly in the south of the country, where a lot of the uh, coca bushes were, were growing. Counter-NARC operations started in a big way. We provided them with helicopters and planes, and we provided them with pilots, and with permission from the Colombian government, because they didn't like this, and they hadn't allowed it in the past. We began to spray relatively large you know, with crop dusting planes, right? Uh, relatively large areas of land 
that had been dedicated to coca production and that were essentially being guarded by not only regular peasants, but also by uh, some members of, of the FARC, as well as, as, well as the e, uh, ELN and the AUC, right-wing militia organization. Interdiction efforts ramped up. We started to fund the police and, and the army. We started to do overflights in these areas, not only over the country, but also with respect to the Caribbean. And we started to vet and train national police for the cities. Now, one wrinkle in all of this is that, and before we were able to get in there and use your tax money and mine, what the human rights groups told us in Washington was that, well, you really can't deal with the Colombians because there's tremendous corruption on the law enforcement side. There's tremendous corruption on the side of the army. And we don't want you to just give U.S. taxpayer money away to these organizations, but that you, you make sure that you know to whom it's going. So that required a vetting effort that was set up at the embassy and through the Department of Defense also, you know, and, and the intel agencies in order to determine who, the background of some of the people with whom we were going to be working right? and training. <laughs> This has gone on, it started out, as I say, you know, 2000, went to about 2010, and really did result in all kinds of good things, I would say, I'm a little bit partial to it. But it very much brought to the fore the importance of the Colombian government reforming its judicial sector, allowing more uh, freedom of assembly, um, cleaning out the police force and some of the higher ups in the military who, had, who were indeed uh, guilty of, of human rights abuses in their uh, push, particularly in the rural areas, to take back areas from the FARC and the ELN. And spraying while always controversial, did have some successes, particularly up in the north along the Venezuelan border, but only because we happened to engage a lot of the local farmers up there, as well as some of the clergy, as well as some of the, and, and the, along with the police up there. So, but the jury is still out on how big of a dent we've actually made in the coca bush area, and I'll show you a chart a little bit later, and you can judge for yourself how successful this has been. So all of this goes on. You have Pastrana in, and you have a fella uh, coming in in you know, two, if I remember right, uh, <clears throat> by the name of Alvaro Uribe, whose father was a big landowner and who was killed by, by insurgents. He stays in for eight years. A fella by the name of Santos comes in, then who went to the University of Kansas, and. He's in until, until 16, if, I, if I'm correct. And, uh, or 18, I'm sorry. And Santos actually brings all of the insurgents together. The ELN, the, the, F, the, the FARC, he gets the AUC to demobilize. Well, no, not completely. Some of them went into the bush. Some of the FARC guys are still out there. Not everybody has sort of walked into town and said, we're not going to do this anymore. But nonetheless, as a policy element, the, officially speaking, the Colombians and the U.S. will tell you that Juan Colombia was successful in that regard. So much so that Santos gets the Nobel Peace Prize in 2018 for his work in bringing these various insurgent groups together. Fellow by Ivan Duque, D-Q is now president of Colombia. And actually elections, presidential elections, if I'm not mistaken, are in August of this year. Colombia. Duque is a little right. Santos is a little center left. Before him, Uribe was a little bit more right. And so um, you get a slightly different approach to not only the interdiction of drugs and things, but also regarding 
um, emphasis or not on human rights and on sort of the social sector side of things. <clears throat> but this, this kept going and going until approximately 2017. At the moment, Colombia has budgeted, if I'm not mistaken, for uh, 2021, approximately $30 million for all kinds of things, including their economic development. But before that, and just to give you a little bit of a, a relative um, sense of, of, of the amount of money that went in over the years for, for these efforts, and I just picked a couple of numbers here, but you had $378 million for Columbia in 07. You had $839 million 10 years later. You had $452 million in 2021, and you've got $27 million for 2022. So, you know, your, your chart, if you're looking at a chart, it's sort of going like this, right? But in, from 2000, 2001 to 2010, average was probably about 450 to 500 million dollars a year with respect to our foreign assistance writ large, including the interdiction efforts of the, of the Colombians and, and the US, right? Now, Milwaukee County's budget is about 1.3 billion a year for 1.2, 1.3 million people out there. So that gives you a little bit of a sense. Colombia's got 50 million people. And so 500 million a year. There are those who say that that was a relatively good investment. Right? Things are not, you know, perfect, needless to say. While this is happening, of course, things are heating up in Mexico. And Mexico, which some have said is probably the most important country in the world for us internationally speaking, in terms of international affairs, simply because it happens to be on our border, there's 130 million people sitting here. And we've been joined at the hip quite literally from the beginning of time. Uh, but because of this influx of drugs, as well as huge corruption in Mexico, the cartels in Mexico, and you know there's HBO movies and Netflix all about this now, you know, narcos and everything else, really took off. And in 04, the assault gun ban, which we had in the States for during the Clinton administration, about half the Clinton administration into the Bush administration, expired. And Congress, the administration, didn't do anything about it. And so there are some that say that assault bans, or assault rifles rather, really started to come in to uh, Mexico at that time. And indeed, violence really began to peak in, in 06 and 07. A fellow named uh, Calderon was then Mexican president. And he went after the cartels hammer and tongs, but they gave as good as they got. And so for the past 10 to 15 years, we have homicide rates in Mexico of between 25 and 30,000 people out of a population of about 130 million, right? Compared to the United States, which over that same period of time has anywhere from 5,000 to 6, 6,500 homicide deaths right? over that same period of time in a country that's more than twice the size. So this really, and weak institutions in Mexico, police corruption, and again, an inability like Colombia to really put, to have agency and purchase throughout, throughout the entire country. Right? So, in, in 18, uh, a, a real old, old school, he's younger than me, but uh, 
political by the name of uh, Manuel Lopez Obrador comes in, and um, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador. And he essentially, in a rather deft way, says, you know, we don't know that we want to necessarily cooperate with you guys anymore, at least in the way you're doing your, your drug enforcement stuff. He says, as far as I'm concerned, the war on drugs is over. We're losing all of these people. He's, a, he's, a, he's very much out of old, old school, um, what they call uh, PRI, uh, Mexican political party, a revolutionary institutional party of Mexico, which has ruled for most of the 20th century. But he shifted gears. He's still a big statist. Right? He still believes in a lot of government intervention and regulation. If, you know, if he's, he is not a, um, he's center left. And he's started talking about, I want, I think what we need to do is really stop this interdiction business and have much more of a, um, uh, an approach to the narcos wherein, you know, there are brothers, there are Mexican brothers, you know, wherein we talk to them. And so he came up with this meme or with this, this particular poster, which says, abrazos, you know, abrazos, right? So hugs and not bullets. And he said to us, you know, I don't know that we're going to necessarily cooperate all that much. And indeed, um, violence continues apace. Now, he said to, and Calderon started to talk about this, uh, and then a fellow named Peña Nieto who came in after, after Calderon, and then uh, Lopez Obrador came in. You know, we think that we would also like a little bit of money as you've given to the Colombians. And so, in 07, Congress appropriated approximately 1.5 uh, billion dollars, which has been dispersed over this 10-year period of time, and another $250 million from 2018 to 2019 for what they call the Medida Initiative. Now that's got a much more um, social side, demand reduction, kind of uh, lack of heavy-duty interdiction type of elements here, right, as compared to Plan Colombia, although police training and guns and things like this are certainly still a part of it. But AMLO says to Biden last year, Lopez Obrador says, look, he said, let's fix this up. And, and let's just, let's, let's not call this the Medida Initiative anymore. I want something different. We still have these problems with drugs. We still have this problem with the lack of state presence. And I'm a little concerned. So they agreed to call whatever this is gonna be and how much money, however much money is gonna be, the US-Mexico Bicentennial Framework. No details regarding it, other than the fact that it's not going to be particularly law enforcement focused. Right? But that will be used in mostly in Mexico, although some of it in Central America too, in, in terms of primary health care, roads, education, things like this, in order to stop some of the uh, immigration that's coming up. So, So we have, we have prohibition, we have the Nixon and Reagan years, we have the Colombians and the Mexicans fighting it out. The Colombian cartels are broken, <coughs> Plan Colombia law, and then the Medida Initiative, demand reduction and public health strategies, where we, it appears we're, we're, we're tilting a little bit. And so just to give you a couple of, of graphics here which may help to sort of frame this whole business too. <coughs> I don't think it's going away anytime soon. But you know, here's where you've got pretty much your your growing areas here. Not a lot in Ecuador, interestingly enough, if any. I've been up along here and haven't seen any, haven't seen any right in this area here, which is rather isolated. Peru is a big producer. Bolivia has always been a, a big producer, and off and on. And we get various levels of cooperation from the Colombians and the Peruvians and the Bolivians regarding the growing of coca, which is an ancient plant which is endemic to the region, and which is part of the Inca and the Armaya and the indigenous culture there. And indeed, you can buy, in some places here in the States, you can buy coca leaf tea, because it just happens to be a part of everyday 
social uh, interaction, certainly amongst the Peruvians and the Bolivians. And then, of course, you know, you had, anybody know who this fellow is? So, this man was Pablo Escobar, Colombian drug dealer, probably built almost 30 years ago now in 93 in Bogota with assistance from the US. He was a, a huge drug trafficker and really quite violent fellow who almost brought the government then of Gavidia, Cesar Gavidia, to its knees because of his attacks against police and, and the army and almost had a kind of semi-autonomous sort of area in which he lived. Ultimately captured by the Colombians, put in jail, walked out, started to do his stuff again, and then made the mistake of basically saying to the Colombians, not only are you not going to capture me, but I'm gonna overthrow your government. So now it got pretty political. And that's when the Colombians, along with our assistants, went after him, hammer and thongs. And ultimately killed him in, in a, caught him in his uh, condo in, uh, if I remember right, actually in, uh, in Medellin. But he was sort of a Robin Hood to a lot of people. He gave away a lot of his money, certainly to the slum areas, to the poor people around, and he had quite a following. And indeed was, um, as I recall, was elected just for a year or two to, to Congress. So these were the types of people who not only the Colombians, but the US was getting really quite exercised about. Not a bad guy, not a criminal, but certainly uh, uh, about 14 years he served as president of Bolivia. And this is a fellow named Evo Morales, poor peasant who made it to the presidency and served for quite some time, visited Washington a couple of times. He gave a speech at the UN whereby he held up a coca leaf and he said, this is part of our heritage, you know, don't take it away from us. And we were pushing him to eradicate a lot of the coca fields. Well, a lot of the coca fields, particularly in Bolivia, are run by small farmers. And they make all kinds of stuff out of it, and they make their tea, and it wasn't a particularly popular policy with him. So he's pushed back to it. And he doesn't allow spraying, or didn't allow spraying in Bolivia, as the Colombians had. And then you have AMLO. And here's just an interesting graphic I thought. This is, this is, these are areas, if you will, that sort of provide a amenable or propitious sort of agricultural environment for the, for the cultivation of coca. And it's just, it's there, that's where it is. It's not in Sierra Leone. You know, it's, it, poppies grow in Northern Thailand, I understand rather nicely. But along with the help of the king in Thailand, they were able to eradicate that whole business with at least getting a handle on it. And uh, these areas are, are, you know, are difficult to access. They're difficult to, uh, the Chapare Valley, which is where uh, Morales lived for quite some time as a boy, and saw, as a young boy, Bolivian police kill and burn a peasant leader because the, he was resisting having the police come in and take away his coca, or manually eradicate it. And you might imagine that that stayed, has stayed with him. But Colombia continues to be the biggest producer of, of the raw stuff. And here's, this is a more relevant one, and this, this is actually from uh, a section of the uh, State Department called the uh, Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement. And this is, this is 2020, and you can see the, the darker colors indicate the amount of crop cultivation density of hectares per square kilometer. So some of these areas are just rife with coca, coca bush, okay? It gets to, it gets to be about like this, and they'll bring in peasant kids to uh, take the leaves off every, uh, sometimes you get three crops a year out of this stuff. And then it's distilled and broken down into a paste with some uh, precursor chemicals 
like, like ether and gasoline and stuff and a precipitate comes out and that gives you your coca base which is then further refined in, in labs in Mexico and other places around the world. And then here's an interesting graphic, and I don't know if you can if you can appreciate this. It's not a particularly good picture. I pulled it off of a State Department publication. But because of our interdiction efforts in the in the 90s and in the noughts, the first decade of this generation. We've, we've gone after these, as they nicely call them, non-commercial maritime events. Well, this is mostly small boats, sometimes semi-submersibles or these sort of jerry-rigged submarines, right? that come out of very isolated places. These are very isolated places here in Colombia and northern Ecuador. And people come up offloaded in Guatemala, get it into Mexico, and it heads up north. This, these routes here, above here in any case, have been pretty well interdicted by our, by the DEA and by, um, by our government. Pentagon's been involved in, in doing overflights and things like this. But what that indicates is there's just a lot of boats out there who happen to be going up north and offloading their, their, their cocaine. Stay with me for a little bit with this one. Now, this is just out of Colombia, and this will give you, and then if you understand this, then you can make an intelligent judgment about whether interdiction and spraying coca and everything like this over the past 20 years has had any kind of effect. Now, this is 1994 <laughs> and to, to 2020, right? You've got coca cultivation in the green one here. Right? And these are, here you've got 170,000 hectares of coca in Columbia. Here you've got 209,000, here you've got 245,000, right, in 2020. The, the other one here, and this is an interesting little wrinkle or policy uh, problem that we've had with the United Nations. The United Nations has an office called the UNODC. It's the UN Office on Drug Control. They're out of Vienna, Austria. And they do stuff all over the world trying to determine where illicit drugs are coming from. But we've never, un unfortunately, been able to get together with the ODC, with the UN ODC, and say, we think that there's this many hectare, hectares in, in Colombia, and the UN is saying, no, no, your planes are bad, your cameras are bad, right? You don't know what you're looking at. We don't think there's that much, right? So, whichever number you wish to use, it's, clear nonetheless that hectorage maintains a relatively high amount. And the blue indicates our spraying, right? Political pressure and just some common sense has led us to cooperate with the Colombians on manual eradication, whereby troops go in and they actually pull the bushes up. So you do get some of that here, 06, 07, 08. You had a change of government. Calderon wanted to do some of this stuff because people were getting annoyed, particularly the small farmers out there. Didn't like the fact that these toxins, right, were coming out of a plane and taking care, wiping out their coca bush. And in some instances, probably taking out their, their, their crop of mangoes too. Or papayas, right? And then substitution, which is an old term. We used to call this in the 70s and the 80s crop substitution. But since there's nothing really from an economic <coughs> standpoint that can produce the kind of yield for, for a guy who's making $1,200 a year on, on a five-acre plot in southern Colombia, 
the entire policy shifted and we started to call this stuff alternative development, meaning a much more whole and government approach to, to, to the cultivation and the trafficking and the distilling of, of, of coca, of cocaine. But as you can see, it continues to be a, a, a real battle. This is a chart that gives you a better look at, at the situation regarding the Andean countries, the Colombias, the Bolivias, and the, and the Peru's. And it says pretty much the same with respect to Colombia that you just saw. But for instance, <clears throat> if you just look at the total number, right? 06, 156, 156,000, let's say 157,000 hectares, Boom, all of a sudden, 181,000, right? Up to 213,000 in 2016. You get a chart sort of looking like this, a little bit like this, okay? Up and down. And you have what is sometimes called the balloon effect, right? Wherein, where you have success in Colombia with respect to eradication. You're, you're going to have trouble because in Peru, the traffickers are going to move and they're going to cultivate those particular areas. Or the same thing in Bolivia. If you tamp down in Bolivia, the traffickers and the growers will go over into Peru. And so there's this constant fight, not unlike a whack-a-mole sort of situation, wherein you have uh, you know, a, very, a very difficult situation that, that's fed by huge issues in terms of state presence, income disparities, resource disparities, particularly with respect to land, particularly with respect to uh, one's title to land, one's size of, of uh, farm that, that he or she has. And as a result, the A whole of government approach is required to get at this stuff. The Woodrow Wilson Center, which is a federally funded think tank in DC and does a lot of stuff on Latin America, was saying that um, you need to have a, uh, essentially a, a situation wherein you have a, an alternative development situation whereby your local government is investing in all the kinds of social services and public institutions that we kind of take for granted here, like a library, right? And uh, in order to get rid of this stuff. The other thing you need to do is much more with respect to public education on drug use, i.e. go after the demand side of things as opposed to the supply side and the interdiction stuff, okay? And, um, Lastly, continue to cooperate and uh, have a sustained amount of foreign aid that goes into these places that you can use. And I say that because with that, you can plan. You know, if you know what you're gonna get from one year to the next, out for five years, you can plan interesting and decent projects and you can deal with people um, on a regular and predictable basis. So one last thing I'll leave you with, let me go back to here. Sort of the major chapters over the past really 60 or 70 years. We seem to be going towards demand reduction in public health strategies and even public health strategies with respect to incarceration here in the United States for possession. Mandatory minimum sentences were done during the Reagan administration. So we've got the largest incarcerated population in the entire world here. It's something like uh, seven tenths of 1% of our population happen to be in jail. The vast majority of those particularly in federal prisons, happen to be people who are involved in drug trafficking. And mandatory minimums came in during the Reagan administration, and then the Obama administration, Bush started to talk about this too, but the, 
Obama administration and then Trump, interestingly enough, talked about it too. And I thought signed some executive orders regarding it. Has, um, so has uh, pushed a bit in order to make the uh, laws regarding possession and use not, not quite so draconian. And if I'm not mistaken, 18 states here in the United States now happen to allow marijuana for recreational use. So that's really taken the, the wind out of uh, certainly marijuana growers who haven't been particularly um, large in any case in, in, in Colombia. But nonetheless, you also have to provide an important source of revenue for a number of different states around the, around the US. So here, here's where we are a bit right now. A lot of talk about demand reduction in public health strategies as we speak. I said I was gonna leave you with something. One last thing, and it was just, it just involves incentives for people to do this, and you can get a good idea of it. Um, you can get a good idea of, of, of the incentives for somebody to do this if you just take a look at per capita income. Per capita income, if you just break us down here in the United States with 330 million people, is approximately $66,000 a year, right? That's just for planning purposes, right? So, okay. Well, so in, in countries like, so Colombia, interesting, is sophisticated. Anybody been to Colombia, by the way? Bogota or Medellin, it's really lovely places in many regards. But, and a lot safer now in any case than they were 20 years ago. But Colombia's per capita income is $5,300 a year. 50 million people, $5,300 a year per person, okay? Honduras, where a lot of this stuff happens to be coming through and whose president indeed was arrested two weeks ago, ex-president uh, was, was arrested, Hernandez, just two weeks ago. He left office in January after serving two terms. And his brother's in federal prison right here. And he's probably gonna be extradited to the United States in order to stand trial. It's the Congress, the new Honduran Congress said, yeah, okay. You can take them. They had to approve it. Right? So Honduras has $2,400 a year in per capita income. Right? Guatemala, $4,600 a year in per capita income. Nicaragua, $1,900 a year. Mexico, interestingly, $8,300 a year. These are World Bank numbers from 2020. Peru, 6,100. Bolivia, about 12 million people, 3,100. 3, so, some, some trafficker comes in. Anybody been to Costa Rica? So, what, were you on the Pacific side? Were you, you're on the Pacific side. So, here's where a lot of the stuff was going on, it, and continues. But as you can see, and this is a much more interesting route for traffickers. But along here, it, you know, really begins about here in Panama, goes up the Costa Rican coast and into Nicaragua and, and Honduras. It's sparsely populated, lots of mangrove swamps, and a difficult area to traverse. And nonetheless, there's towns out there, there are mayors, there are public officials. And what the traffickers have done in many regards is to suborn a lot of these small village public officials and say, you know, I really need to bring my boat in here tomorrow night. And I, I hope you understand, you know. And, don't say anything to anybody about it. Oh, and by the way, a plane will be dropping in too, you know, or we're going to put some stuff on that. If we just might be able to use your strip or one of those big fields out here. And so that's how Honduras, Nicaragua, not too much, interestingly enough, a little bit in Costa Rica, certainly Guatemala, uh, have become sort of these conduits to the cocaine trafficking, and how certainly in Honduras's case, Guatemala too. Guatemala has been has had real problems with this. Um, 
have become have become beholden to a lot of the a lot of the Colombian Mexican cartels who are working concert right? and who continue to move this stuff into our country and more and more into into uh, West Africa, which is a jumping off point, Sierra Leone, the Gambia, places like this that are on the bulge, right? Uh, and, and into, into uh, Spain and, and uh, Britain, as well as uh, Germany and, and all the other places that we need to. So our policy has been heavy duty policing and interdiction. Lots of foreign aid over the past few decades with respect to this. And not a lot of emphasis on demand reduction nor public health <coughs> efforts, I think. I mean, in, a, in, a, in just a few words, and we continue to pound away at this, right? With guys from the DEA along with the DOD and the State Department and the USAID people being involved in all, all aspects of trying to push back on this stuff. So, I think I've talked enough. I'm going to leave it right here. But if uh, happy to entertain some questions. Yes, sir. Is there any other demands for cocoa beans other than this black market? Under yeah, yeah. Like for big pharma? Or? Yeah, interesting. Yeah. You know, um, Morales, the Bolivian guy here, that was one of his pitches to the UN many years ago. He said, you know, we make bread with this stuff. We can make coca bread with this stuff. And, you know, it isn't, and it, it, they, the alkaloids are drawn out of it, you know, and it becomes like a vegetable for that matter, you know. But um, big pharma, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, it's an interesting question, though. More in terms of uh, the poppy. Um, at, Poppy has loomed large with respect to pharma, and that's what engendered some of those early talks in the 20s, you know, amongst the various powers that be regarding uh, a, um, some kind of control over opium, opium production and opium use, <clears throat> because the pharmaceutical groups indeed wanted that stuff for morphine and things. An interesting anecdote from a book called uh, the Limits of Friendship by a fellow named Robert Pastor, P-A-S-T-O-R. And a, a Mexican guy is, uh, who used to be foreign minister there by the name of Jorge Castaneda. They say that in 19, in, during the war, that the U.S. unable to get enough supplies of opium in order to distill and get soporifics, morphine, and things like this for the battlefield, asked the Mexicans if we could plant some poppies in, in Chihuahua, Sinaloa, and, uh, and Chihuahua, Sinaloa, and one other state there, more up in the upper third of the, of the country. <clears throat> and they said, sure, it's up in here. Yeah. Still there, <laughs> still being, we tried to eradicate some of it after the war, but we used that as a basis actually during World War II because we couldn't bring in any of the opium from, from South, from Asia during that time, right? In these different countries, what percentage of the per capita that you were talking about is related to either growing or trafficking? Do you have any feel for that, or is that hard to figure out? That's hard to figure out. That's, it could be important to them. To the countries? Yes. Interesting question. Yes, and I, and I think you're right. I mean, my, that's personally speaking, yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I, I have talked to a couple of people in, at the embassy in Bogota and in, and in uh, when I was, I was in and out of Colombia at one point in 98 to 2001. But uh, one analyst said to me that he didn't think that there was an element or a sector of Colombian society that hadn't somehow been <coughs> influenced in one form or another by the amount of money that's flowing uh, in and out of in and out of those places. And I was last in Colombia in uh, in twenty uh, in twenty seventeen in Bogota. I was actually I was an adjunct for a bit at Marquette at the business school, and I took some well, a couple of professors and I went down to Bogota for an uh, international student business thing, half a credit or something like this, right? Just driving around Bogota, 
which is why I asked if anyone had been to Bogota, you know, lots of beautiful luxury apartment buildings that are empty. And lots of uh, nice car dealerships, right? Um, that aren't necessarily reflective of, it seemed to me, having, having worked in Africa and Latin America and Pakistan, that, you know, is indicative of sort of the a financial deepening, right? As the, as the Wongs would say. A, a, a reflective of a financial sector that's necessarily uh, traditional. Okay. But I, yeah, I think you're right. Yes, sir? Well, if people want to understand what yeah. take all of this the political, yeah. moral, social, etc. Sure. Sure. I'm only looking at direct not indirect factors in the economic question. The investment that the United States alone has made over the years in interdiction, eradication, et cetera, just those, those alone, direct costs or avoid. What has been the ROI? Because when I look at your map and look at the deep purple, and then I look at the other graph, which yeah. shows it doesn't matter, right. because the production continues to go up, maybe yeah. it'll go down, for a while, et cetera. Right. And you're absolutely right. But what's been our ROI on that? The real people like you talked about, yeah. the direct so, cost of steel. Right. Has right. anyone looked at that and said, you know what, it's time do what we did with uh, gambling, Booze. yeah, right. Taking all of the moral, social, it doesn't, is it making sense? Do you have any numbers so that right. people can make a decision? Is this a smart way to spend precious resources? You know, I, I um, by the way, and confine it to Latin America, which is your specialty, you know, <laughs> right? Here's Asia, and right, like right. No, I. Um, I think there's a number of things going on here. One that I alluded to when I started out by mentioning that quote by Mencken, H.L. Mencken, you know, in our Puritan past and the fact that we just don't, we think there's some moral failing on the part of somebody, you know, who's an alcoholic or a drug addict or something like this. So that's one thing. That, and I, and indeed, you know, I recoil at, you know, uh, awful places, you know, in this country or others, you know, that happen to be ravaged by this kind of stuff. It's a little bit of a blind spot that we have in some, in some regards, you know, about um, when, when we talk about legalizing everything. Because that's not the end of the story. The, the end of the story is, so you legalize that, but then you need to regulate it, you need to tax it. Oh, by the way, you have to set up facilities in order to take care of people you know, who are perhaps abusing that kind of thing. So you can't just take a libertarian approach to it and say, you know, use your God-given free will and do what you want, right? And so an entire structure, it seems to me, and I'm not talking about a private sector structure necessarily, but it would have to be set up in order to make something like that happen in a, in a, in a civilized way, right? Uh, Yes. Nonetheless, do we have some facts on we spent yeah. trillions yeah. and the ROI on that in terms of decreased inflow has been right. Has been uh, are you right, aware uh, of it? I don't know. Well, I think that the, I mentioned that you know policy analysts on both sides of the aisle will tell you that Colombia, Plan Colombia, was quite a success. But we hadn't done anything there in that measure, you know, ever. And now it's sort of diminishing. Uh, there are still insurgent groups around. And so for me, you, you, need, you need a sustained uh, effort on the part of both governments and cooperation. And you need huge investments on the part of the host country with respect to, uh, with respect to their social sector. May I ask one follow-up? Sure. I noted on that 
image that you see out front of the floor. Uh -huh. There is a tiny, tiny, tiny thin line going into the toolbox. Why? Yeah. How do you account, or how is that accounted for? Yeah. Take a look at that. Yeah. It's an island. Take right. a look at the yeah, right here. Republic yeah. and Haiti right here. Well, the Cubans, the Cubans have been pretty nasty about it. You ah. know? I mean, the Cubans have been, yeah, I mean, they don't, they, they won't do this, right? They're not going to mess with it. And they've, okay. they've taken care of people who do that. So their approach to the issue is? It's interdiction. Fighting. Yeah, right. Although, yeah. 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 And, and I, yeah, I don't know that we, somebody's talking to the Cubans, I think, from our government on this. Yes, sir. Um, can you talk just a little bit about uh, all those lines are going significantly south of the Rio Grande River? Yeah. Uh, I assume it gets here somehow. Yeah, so, so what exactly, you know, so, so you, it's offloaded here, right? Mm -hmm. And any number of, of people who are part of the cartels are tossing it onto trucks and and uh, on backpacks and uh, trains and and moving it up. But this it stops here because this is essentially a, a maritime chart. I there are other charts that'll show you how it goes, mm -hmm. but Guatemala uh, is particularly Guatemala. And I'm a bit prejudiced. I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Guatemala a million years ago. So, uh, but, but I, I would say um, it's particularly open and corrupt with respect to money laundering and drug trafficking. And so you can, you can basically, it, it's, relatively, it's relatively easy in many regards to do a number of um, internationally prohibited acts, you know, regarding money and drugs and things like this through Guatemala. But is it possible to stop it at the border? Where the Which one? The US ours? Border. Ours? Yeah. Border. yeah. So, right. So I didn't mean to sound flip, but I, it, 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 well, you know, um, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think that you can stop it, stop that flow. They're going to go this way then, right? They're going to come up here. And I'm not talking maritime necessarily. I'm talking about, you know, trucks and planes and people coming in. Yeah, right. So hence the emphasis as people are beginning to talk on demand reduction. Doing coca every day, you know, as you get up in the morning is a bad thing for you, right? You shouldn't be doing this stuff like we did with cigarettes, like we've done with alcohol, you know, although, yes ma'am. You're not gonna stop, you're not gonna stop the traffic and you're gonna stop it at the border because there's too much demand. There's too much demand, I would agree with you there. So why yeah. doesn't our government buy the cocaine directly from the farmers that all those countries get some kind of deal with the, whoever is the president and we sell, sell it ourselves up here and have some regulation on how much we can sell, wouldn't that put a damper on the cartels? You know, um, your idea isn't a new one. And, um, and, but it, it, it would require, again, such a massive uh, effort. You know, I was always impressed when I was overseas by people saying, well, why doesn't the U.S. do this or why doesn't the U.S. do that? Why can't they take care of this or why can't they take care of that? And, you know, it's, we're pretty impressive and strong and, and have a terrific history, but there are some things that just aren't of particular priority, nor are they within our capabilities, quite honestly. And so. But that way the farmers wouldn't be risking their livelihood and maybe hiring people. In some instances, what we've done under these alternative development programs is to give people anywhere from $500 to $1,200 to $3,000 check. In a couple of countries we've done this, if they pull out all of their coca crop, right? Which might reflect two years of, of revenue, for instance, that they've made, right? We did that for a while in Colombia, actually, and had some success with it. But then, like any self-respecting capitalist, 
a lot of the a lot of the campesinos took the money and they went to a different place and they started a different a different acreage you know they planted it in a different place yes sir uh it seems to me we're kind of beating a dead horse in this country uh it's been 50 years that this process has been going on the, the war on drugs portugal seems to have solved it quite a while and quite well mm -hmm. Why don't we send a few agents over there and see how they do it and impl uh, implicate it in here? It, it would, uh, I think, be a whole lot cheaper. Like you said, we Im implement it here in the implement States. Implement it here. In, um, in the States? In the States. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're incarcerating yeah. millions That's in, a huge in issue. prisons. I agree with you. Yeah. And prison guards, they, they could be just well trained to. to distribute uh, stuff here until it would be solved. But we're, we're just, as long as we've got a demand here, the supply is going to continue. I, I, I think you're right. Those iron laws of supply and demand of economics are, yeah. are, are going to keep this thing going, particularly given the factors that you have, you know, regarding somebody's annual, annual, annual uh, uh, per capita income. The other thing you have in Latin America, which is unique to the place, is, is its land structure. And, and when the Spaniards came in, they put in a system called latifundios. And latifundios were essentially gifts from the king to, to Joe Conquistador, who happened to take over this particular part of the land. And because of his service to the crown, he was given you know just vast amounts of land. Well, the vestiges of that sort of land tenure system are alive and well in Latin America. Hence, your relatively large peasant agrarian sectors, right, who have never had title to a piece of land. They work on a larger estate, perhaps, right? And uh, also, the, it meant an export-led agricultural economy for the most part that never really evolved or matured into small manufacturing or an industry sort of base, right? And that's, we didn't have that, right? We didn't have that. We had the we had the railroad going west. We basically moved forward, and we had the Homestead Act, right? Where you get 160 acres. I was reading this little vignette here regarding how this how Franklin came about. Guys came out here, this Irishman, and he got 160 acres, right? In the 1830s, and the rest is history. Right? Doesn't happen here. Didn't happen here. Yes, sir. I was just curious about your thoughts about how the cartels are now switching to or producing fentanyl. Yeah, it's yeah. It's becoming their cash crop. Yeah, it, it's, an, it's an area that I'm not familiar with, to be honest with you. But that's happened over the past 10 to 15 years, the synthetic stuff. And, 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 the, and the precursors, I understand a lot of it's done in Mexico, but the Chinese also do it. And the Chinese also bring over precursor chemicals in many regards in order to, and then offload them in Mexico, where those are put together in order to uh, create things like ecstasy and fentanyl and, and those and those kinds of drugs, right? The methamphetamine stuff, right? also. Yeah. Yes, sir? Hey, you talked about drugs, but drugs could be alcohol, tobacco, prescription painkillers, and uh, we are giving the name of legal uh, drugs, and illegal drugs could be cocaine, Right. Well, in some case, uh, marijuana has been legalized. But the degree of uh, destruction is with both legal as well as illegal, and we spend tremendous amount for eradication. But there are loopholes that we could control, or we don't want to control, or we cannot control. There is another question, but it seems that where we have the economy going, we let it happen. Seems we are only 4% of the whole world's population, but we consume 80% of the global supply of food. So uh, that is kind of injustice to the people of Latin America that since they don't have any medicinal purposes or for us any economic value, you will put a stop on them and you will not put a stop on them. You know, you're, you're touching on a, a debate that goes on every day in Washington, D.C. You know, it's those, but then policy is made, 
And the policymakers and the guys up on, on the Hill, you know, say, yeah, but we want to protect our country. This is a political issue as far as we're concerned. And we're going to do these things in order to, in order to prevent continued uh, importation of illegal drugs. And indeed, um, in the case of Colombia, and one of the reasons we, the Bush, the Clinton and Bush administration got rather exercised about Colombia at that point. <clears throat> Colombia had been exporting cocaine, you know, for decades, right? But what, what got them, Pastrana, President Pastrana came up in 98, he said, by the way, I've got these insurgents. I've got the FARC, I've got these leftist guerrillas, right, who had been operating since the mid 50s. And they're gonna overthrow my government. So the juxtaposition of those two policy issues, right? the insurgents doing what they were doing, right? And the fact that Colombia happened to be, particularly along with guys like Pablo Escobar, whose picture I showed you there, <laughs> at least up until 1993, sort of focus the mind of the US government on being able, on wanting to do something for, for Pastrana. And we've always been relatively close to the Colombians too, interestingly enough. The Colombians fought next to us in, in the Korean War. As a matter of fact, they sent a couple of battalions over with us to fight against the North Koreans and the Chinese in the early, in 51 and 52. So, and, and they're, a big, they're our third biggest trading partner in the Western Hemisphere, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> Got a Nobel Prize winner or two. Gabriel Garcia Marquez, you know, they're a sophisticated, interesting society. And so all of those kinds of things come into play. You're right, though, about this stuff. Yeah. Why are you, here's, here's the spokesperson, here's the spokesperson for, for the position you just articulated. And uh, it, it, it's Evo Morales. He's got, he's got, he made it to, High school, and I think he's got a year to a technical school. Trilingual, father was a illiterate, and mother were illiterate peasants, right? Bolivian nationalist, left the center. And he's saying, just get out of here. He threw the DEA out of La Paz, out of the embassy. He went to the ambassador in 06 or 07 and he said, get the DEA out of here. I don't want you guys here, right? And, and the DEA left, right? <laughs> so, he would share. He would share your position on this, right? Yes, ma'am. What exactly is he supposed to do? Do you get him? I'm not all that familiar, to be honest with you. Although I thought Portugal. You're talking about Portugal. They had a big demand reduction. Uh, yeah, the treatment therapy. Treatment therapy stuff. Yeah. 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 Right. You know, it seems the spending good money, they're not getting any results. I still think it would be better if we sold it and read it. Sure, sure. <laughs> that, 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 that's, a, that's a legitimate position. That's a, as I say, as I say, you need, you need big public institutions and cooperation amongst countries, and you need to be able to keep a sustained uh, amount of money up, right? We're distracted at the moment by Ukraine and Russia, for instance. Right? I, you know, I'm not being facetious, I mean, so, um, and, you know, periodically the Middle East, right, and immigration, and all of these other things, right? Yes, sir? Uh, wasn't there a, a government truce with uh, FARC and recently, and has, has that made a difference? You know, part of the Plan Colombia, so a truce between the government of Colombia and the FARC, the, the, the largest leftist insurgent group in Colombia, the oldest certainly, it's the longest running insurgency in the Western Hemisphere, as a matter of fact. So, um, yeah, the, the, uh, as part of the peace accords that Santos negotiated and for which he got the Nobel Prize in 2016, the FARC agreed to disarm in those negotiations, an, uh, the vast majority of FARC fighters, and there are anywhere <clears throat> between 8,000 to 12,000, withdrew. And again, we had a program wherein of reintegration for those people, for those fighters, a lot. And we helped them get jobs. We set up different organizations there, civil society groups. We assisted the government in, in, in making sure that a lot of these guys, most of whom, you know, were 
for peasant kids, right? Got some education and got somehow reestablished in their in their uh, in their villages. We did the same thing with the ELN, which is more an urban-based guerrilla group, and uh, and the AUC, the right-wing group, which had the most guys, fought uh, demobilization, as we called it, for quite a bit. Nonetheless, they also disarmed most of them in any case. But with respect to all three of those insurgent groups, there are elements that said, we're not doing this. We don't trust the government. There had been a, a disarmament or a truce in the early 90s, and a, the guerrillas formed a political party, uh, and many of them, over 3,000 of them, over a period of two or three years, were assassinated by the right during that from, and I forget the dates now, but so um, the FARC and the ELM were saying elements of them, in any case, we're not gonna lay down our arms. But it did, yes, it helped. And indeed, a peace accord was signed. The guy running, there's a fellow named Gustavo uh, Petro, who's been in politics, and the next guerrilla, left, left wing guerrilla, is running for president now in this, these elections this year. And he's put the fear of God, of course, in the more conservative elements of society. But he's saying, I'm not going back into the bush. We need to operate together. He comes out of those peace negotiations, Petro does. So, yeah, it was helpful. And I would contend that Palm Colombia and our efforts there helped to move the needle a little bit in that regard. Anybody else? Okay. It won't stop at all. It, I, it's not going to stop. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. It was a pleasure.